When he returned to Ayemenem, after his years away from home, Veluta still had about him the same quickness, the sureness, and Velia Papen feared for him now more than ever. But this time he held his peace. He said nothing, at least not until the terror took hold of him. Not until he saw night after night a little boat being rowed across the river. Not until he saw it return at dawn. Not until he saw what his untouchable son had touched, more than touched, entered, loved. When the terror took hold of him, Velia Papin went to Mamachi. He stared straight ahead with his mortgaged eye. He wept with his own one. One cheek glistened with tears. The other stayed dry. Velia Papin told Mamachi what he had seen. He offered to kill his son with his own bare hands, to destroy what he had created. In the next room, Baby Kochima heard the noise and came to find out what it was all about. She saw grief and trouble ahead, and secretly, in her heart of hearts, she rejoiced. She said, among other things, How could she stand the smell? Haven't you noticed? They have a particular smell, these paravans. And she shuddered theatrically, like a child being force-fed spinach. Veluta, Veliapapen, and Kutapen lived in a little laterite hut, downriver from the Ayemenem house, a three-minute run through the coconut trees for Estepen and Rahel. In the months since he had returned, they had grown to be best of friends. They were forbidden from visiting his house, but they did. It was Veluta who made Rahel her luckiest ever fishing rod and taught her and Esta to fish. And on that sky-blue December day, it was him that she saw through her red sunglasses, marching with a red flag at the level crossing outside Cochin. A man with a red flag and a face like a knot opened Rahel's door because it wasn't locked. The doorway was full of men who had stopped to stare. Feeling hot, baby? The man like a knot asked Rahel kindly in Malayalam. Then unkindly, ask your daddy to buy you an air condition. And he hooted with delight at his own wit and timing. Rahel smiled back at him, pleased to have Chaco mistaken for her father. Like a normal family. Don't answer, baby Kochima whispered hoarsely. Look down, just look down. The man with the flag turned his attention to her. She was looking down at the floor of the car. Hello, sister, the man said carefully in English. What is your name, please? When baby Kochima didn't answer, he looked back at his co-hecklers. She has no name. What about Mudalali Maria Kuti, someone suggested with a giggle. Mudalali in Malayalam means landlord. The man, like a knot, gave baby Kochima his red flag as a present. Here, he said, hold it. Baby Kochima held it, still not looking at him. Wave it, he ordered. She had to wave it. She had no choice. It smelled of new cloth and a shop, crisp and dusty. She tried to wave it as though she wasn't waving it. Okay, then, the man said to baby Kochima in English. Bye-bye. He slammed the sky-blue door shut. Baby Kochima wobbled. The crowd around the car unclotted and went on with its march. Baby Kochima rolled the red flag up and put it on the ledge behind the back seat. She put her rosary back into her blouse where she kept it with her melons. She busied herself with this and that, trying to salvage some dignity. After the last few men walked past, Chaco said it was all right now to roll down the windows. Are you sure it was him? Chaco asked Rahel. Who? Rahel said, suddenly cautious. Are you sure it was Veluta? Hmm, Rahel said, playing for time, trying to decipher Esther's frantic thought signals. I said, are you sure the man you saw was Veluta? Chaco said for the third time. It almost looked like him. So you're not sure then? O almost not. Rahel slid a look at Esther for approval. I saw Veluta at home before we left, Esther said brightly. So how could it be him? In the days that followed, baby Kochima focused all her fury at her public humiliation on Veluta. In her mind, he grew to represent the march, and the man who had forced her to wave the Marxist party flag, and the man who had christened her 
Modalali Mariakuti, and all the men who had laughed at her. She began to hate him. Rahel looked at her watch. Ten to two. Still no train. She put her chin on the windowsill. She could feel the gray gristle of the felt that cushioned the window glass pressing into her chin skin. She took off her sunglasses to get a better look at the dead frog squashed on the road. It was so dead and squashed, so flat, that it looked more like a frog-shaped stain on the road than a frog. With the certitude of a true believer, Velia Papen had assured the twins that there was no such thing in the world as a black cat. He said that there were only black cat-shaped holes in the universe. The sun shone through the Plymouth window directly down at Rahel. She closed her eyes and shone back at it. Amu had told them the story of Julius Caesar and how he was stabbed by Brutus, his best friend in the Senate, and how he fell to the floor with knives in his back and said, Et tu, Brute! Then fall, Caesar! It just goes to show, Amu said, that you can't trust anybody. Mother, father, brother, husband best friend? Nobody. Rahel blew an inadvertent spit bubble. Amu hated them blowing spit bubbles. She said it reminded her of Baba, their father. She said that he used to blow spit bubbles and shiver his leg. According to Amu, only clerks behave like that, not aristocrats. Though Baba wasn't a clerk, Amu said he often behaved like one. When they were alone, Esther and Rahel sometimes pretended that they were clerks. They would blow spit bubbles and shiver their legs and gobble like turkeys. In the only photograph they had seen of their father, which Amu allowed them to look at once, he was wearing a white shirt and glasses. With one arm, he held Esther on his shoulders. Esther was smiling, with his chin resting on his father's head. Rahel was held against his body with his other arm. She looked grumpy and bad-tempered, with her baby legs dangling. Someone had painted rosy blobs onto their cheeks. Amu said that he had only carried them for the photograph, and even then he had been so drunk that she was scared he'd drop them. Amu said she had been standing just outside the photograph, ready to catch them if he did. Still, except for their cheeks, Esther and Rahel thought it was a nice photograph. "'Will you stop that?' Amu said loudly. "'Sorry, Amu,' Rahel said. "'Oh, come on,' Chaco said. "'You can't dictate what she does with her own spit.' "'Mind your own business,' Amu snapped." Esther put his head in his lap. His puff was spoiled. A distant train rumble seeped upwards from the frog-stained road. The yam leaves on either side of the railway track began to nod in mass consent. Yes, 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 yes. Rahel had two bumps on her forehead that Esther said would grow into horns. At least one of them would, because she was half Hindu. She hadn't been quick enough to ask him about his horns because whatever she was, he was too. The train was gone so quickly that it was hard to imagine that everybody had waited so long for so little. Filth had laid siege to the Ayemenem house, like a medieval army advancing on an enemy castle. It clotted every crevice and clung to the window panes. The floor was sticky, white walls had turned an uneven gray. Brass hinges and door handles were dull and greasy to the touch. Light bulbs had a film of oil on them. Outside, the rain had stopped. The gray sky curdled, and the clouds resolved themselves into little lumps like substandard mattress stuffing. Estepan appeared at the kitchen door, wet and wiser than he really was. Baby Kochima looked up from the television. Here he comes, she announced to Rahel not bothering to lower her voice. Now watch. He won't say anything. Just watch. She seemed excited. He'll walk straight to his room and wash his clothes. He's very over-clean. He won't say a word. Esther's hair was plastered down in clumps, like the inverted petals of a flower. Slivers of white scalp shone through. Rivulets of water ran down his face and neck. He walked to his room, a gloating halo appeared around baby Kochima's head. See, she said. Rahel followed Esther to his room, Amu's room, once. The room had kept his secrets. It gave nothing away. It was like a room in a hospital after the nurse had just been. The floor was clean, 
the walls white, the cupboard closed, shoes arranged, the dustbin empty. The obsessive cleanliness of the room was the only positive sign of volition from Esther, the only faint suggestion that he had, perhaps, some design for life. Silence hung in the air like secret loss. The terrible ghosts of impossible-to-forget toys clustered on the blades of the ceiling fan, a catapult, a Qantas koala with loosened button eyes, an inflatable goose that had been burst with a policeman's cigarette, two ballpoint pens with silent streetscapes and red London buses that floated up and down in them. Esther put on the tap, and water drummed into a plastic bucket. He undressed in the gleaming bathroom. He stepped out of his sodden jeans, stiff, dark blue, difficult to get out of. He pulled his crushed strawberry T-shirt over his head, smooth, slim, muscular arms crossed over his body. He didn't hear his sister at the door. Rahel watched his stomach suck inwards and his ribcage rise as his wet T-shirt peeled away from his skin, leaving it wet and honey-colored, high cheekbones and hunted eyes, a fisherman in a white-tiled bathroom with sea secrets in his eyes. Had he seen her? Was he really mad? Did he know that she was there? They had never been shy of each other's bodies, but they had never been old enough, together, to know what shyness was. Now they were old enough, old, a viable, diable age. Rahel at the bathroom door, slim-hipped, a lizard on a map on her faded T-shirt, long wild hair with a glint of deep henna red sent unruly fingers down into the small of her back. The diamond in her nostril flashed, sometimes and sometimes not. A thin, gold, serpent-headed bangle glowed like a circle of orange light around her wrist, slim snakes whispering to each other, head to head, her mother's melted wedding ring. At first glance, she appeared to have grown into the skin of her mother, high cheekbones, deep dimples when she smiled, but she was longer, harder, flatter, more angular than Amu had been, less lovely perhaps to those who like roundness and softness in women. Only her eyes were incontestably more beautiful, large, luminous, drownable in, as Larry McCaslin had said, and discovered to his cost. Rahel searched her brother's nakedness for signs of herself. Rahel watched Esther with the curiosity of a mother watching her wet child. A sister, a brother. A woman, a man. A twin, a twin. He was a naked stranger met in a chance encounter. He was the one that she had known before life began. Both things unbearable in their polarity, in their irreconcilable far-apartness. A raindrop glistened on the end of Esther's airlobe, thick, silver in the light, like a heavy bead of mercury. She reached out, touched it, took it away. Esther didn't look at her. He retreated into further stillness as though his body had the power to snatch its senses inwards, away from the surface of his skin, into some deeper, more inaccessible recess. Esther put his wet clothes in a bucket and began to wash them with crumbling, bright blue soap. Abilash Talkies advertised itself as the first cinema hall in Kerala with a 70mm cinemascope screen. The man, with a steel ever-ready torch, said that the picture had started, so to hurry up, they had to rush up the red steps with the old red carpet. It started long ago, he said. Rahel was like an excited mosquito on a leash, flying, weightless, up two steps, down two, up one. She climbed five flights of red stairs for baby Kochima's one. I'm Popeye the sailor man, dum-dum. I live in a caravan, dum-dum. I open the door and fall on the floor. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man, dum-dum. Up two, down two. Up one, jump, jump. Rahel, Amu said, you haven't learned your lesson yet, have you? Rahel had. Excitement always leads to tears, dum-dum. They arrived at the Princess Circle lobby. The torchman 
opened the heavy princess circle door into the fan-whirring, peanut-crunching darkness. It smelled of breathing people and hair oil and old carpets, a magical sound-of-music smell that Rahel remembered and treasured. Smells, like music, hold memories. She breathed deep and bottled it up for posterity. Esther had the tickets, little man. He lived in a caravan, dum-dum. The torchman shone his light on the pink tickets. Road J, numbers 17, 18, 19, 20. They squeezed past irritated people who moved their legs this way and that to make space. The seats of the chairs had to be pulled down. Baby Kochima held Rahel's seat down while she climbed on. She wasn't heavy enough, so the chair folded her into itself like a sandwich stuffing, and she watched from between her knees. The camera soared up in a sky-blue, car-colored, Austrian sky with a clear, sad sound of church bells. Far below, on the ground, in the courtyard of the abbey, the cobblestones were shining. Nuns walked across it. They gathered like ants around a crumb of toast. They had complaints to make to their reverend mother. Sweet singing complaints. About Julie Andrews, who was still up in the hills, singing the hills are alive with a sound of music, and was once again late for mass. People in the audience were turning around. Shh, they said. Shh, shh, shh. There was a voice from outside the picture. It was clear and true, cutting through the fan-whirring, peanut-crunching darkness. There was a nun in the audience. Heads twisted around like bottle caps. Black-haired backs of heads became faces with mouths and mustaches. Shh, they said together. It was Esther who was singing. A nun with a puff. An Elvis pelvis nun. He couldn't help it. Get him out of here, the audience said when they found him. Shut up or get out. Get out or shut up. So Esther shut up. The mouths and mustaches turned away. But then... Without warning, the song came back, and Esther couldn't stop it. Amu, can I go and sing it outside, Esther said, before Amu smacked him. I'll come back after the song. But don't ever expect me to bring you out again, Amu said. You're embarrassing all of us. But Esther couldn't help it. He got up to go. The red sign over the door said exit in a red light. Esther exited. Esther alone sat on the electric blue foam leather car sofa in the Abilash Talkies Princess Circle lobby and sang in a nun's voice as clear as clean water. The man behind the refreshments counter, who'd been asleep on a row of stools, waiting for the interval, woke up. He saw with gummy eyes Esther alone in his beige and pointy shoes and his spoiled puff. I, Edad Cheruka! the orange drink lemon drink man said, in a gravelly voice thick with sleep. What the hell do you think you're doing? Esther sang, along with the nuns in the darkened cinema. I, the orange drink lemon drink man said, look, this is my resting time, so I can't have you singing English songs here. Stop it. His gold wristwatch was almost hidden by his curly forearm hair. He looked like an unfriendly jeweled bear. Esther stopped singing and got up to go back in. Now that I'm up, the orange drink lemon drink man said, now that you've woken me up from my resting time, now that you've disturbed me, at least come and have a drink. It's the least you can do. He had an unshaven, jowly face. His teeth, like yellow piano keys, watched little Elvis the pelvis. No, thank you, Elvis said politely. My family will be expecting me and I finished my pocket money. Pocket money, the orange drink lemon drink man said with his teeth still watching. First English songs, and now pocket money. Where do you live, on the moon? Esther turned to go. Wait a minute, the orange drink lemon drink man said sharply. Just a minute, he said again, more gently. I thought I asked you a question. I asked you where you lived, he said, spinning his nasty web. A Yemenem, Esther said. I live in a Yemenem. My grandmother owns Paradise Pickles and Preserves. She's the sleeping partner. 
is she now, the orange drink lemon drink man said. And who does she sleep with? He laughed a nasty laugh that Esther couldn't understand. Come and have a drink, he said. A free cold drink. Come, come here and tell me all about your grandmother. Esther went, drawn by the yellow teeth. Here, behind the counter, the orange drink lemon drink man said. He dropped his voice to a whisper. It has to be a secret, because drinks are not allowed before the interval. It's a theater offense. Esther went behind the refreshments counter for his free cold drink. Now, if you'll kindly hold this for me, the orange drink lemon drink man said, handing Esther his penis through his soft white muslin dhoti. I'll get you a drink. Orange? Lemon? Esther held it because he had to. Orange? Lemon? The man said. Lemon orange? Lemon, please, Esther said politely. He got a cold bottle and a straw. So he held a bottle in one hand and a penis in the other. Hard, hot, veiny. The orange drink lemon drink man's hand closed over Esther's. His thumbnail was long like a woman's. He moved Esther's hand up and down, first slowly, then fastly. The lemon drink was cold and sweet, the penis hot and hard. The piano keys were watching. So your grandmother runs a factory, the orange drink lemon drink man said. What kind of factory? Many products, Esther said, not looking, with the straw in his mouth. Squashes, pickles, jams, curry powders, pineapple slices. Good, the orange drink lemon drink man said. Excellent. His hand closed tighter over Esther's, tight and sweaty, and faster still. Then the grisly, bristly face contorted, and Esther's hand was wet and hot and sticky. It had egg white on it, white egg white. The lemon drink was cold and sweet. The penis was soft and shriveled like an empty leather change purse. With his dirt-colored rag, the man wiped Esther's other hand. Now finish your drink, he said, and affectionately squished a cheek of Esther's bottom. You mustn't waste it. Think of all the poor people who have nothing to eat or drink. You're a lucky rich boy, with porket money and a grandmother's factory to inherit. And so, behind the refreshments counter, in the Abilash Toki's Princess Circle lobby, in the hall with Kerala's first 70-millimeter cinemascope screen, Estepen Yako finished his free bottle of fizzed lemon-flavored fear. He held his sticky other hand away from his body. When Esther finished his drink, the orange drink lemon drink man said, Finished? Good boy. He took the empty bottle and the flattened straw and sent Esther back into the sound of music. Back inside the hair oil darkness, Esther held his other hand carefully, upwards, as though he was holding an imagined orange. He slid past the audience, past baby Kochima, past Rahel, past Amu. Esther sat down, still holding a sticky orange. And there was Baron von Claptrap, Christopher Plummer, arrogant, hard-hearted, with a mouth like a slit, and a steel-shrill police whistle, a captain with seven children. He pretended not to love them, but he did. He loved them. He loved her, Julie Andrews. She loved him. They loved the children. The children loved them. They all loved each other. They were clean, white children, and their beds were soft with eye dir downs. Esther put his head in his lap. What's the matter, Amu said. If you're sulking again, I'm taking you straight home. Sit up, please, and watch. That's what you've been brought here for. Esther sat up and watched. His stomach heaved. He had a green, wavy, thick, watery, lumpy, seaweedy, floaty, bottomless, bottomful feeling. Amu, he said. Now what? Feeling vomity. Just feeling, or do you want to? Amu's voice was worried. Don't know. Shall we go and try, Amu said. It'll make you feel better. Okay, Esther said. Okay? Okay. Past the audience again. Last time to sing. This time to try and vomit. Exit through the exit. Outside in the marble lobby, the orange drink lemon drink man was eating a sweet. Sweets were free for this man. He had a row of free sweets in dim bottles. 
when he saw the luminous woman with polished shoulders and the little boy, a shadow slipped across his face. Then he smiled his portable piano smile. Out again so soon, he said. Esther was already retching. Amu moonwalked him to the princess circle bathroom. He was held up, wedged between the not-clean basin and Amu's body, legs dangling. Esther convulsed, but nothing came, just thoughts, and they floated out and floated back in. Amu couldn't see them. No, Amu said. No, Esther said. Then wash your face, Amu said. Water always helps. Esther washed his face and hands and face and hands. The orange drink, lemon drink man folded the green sweet wrapper and fixed the fold with his painted thumbnail. Here, the man said with a fistful of sweets, these are for your little mon. No, thank you, Esther said, looking at Amu. Take them, Esther, Amu said. Don't be rude. Esther took them. So, he said, mon says you're from Ayemenem. Yes, Amu said. I come there often. My wife's people are a Yemenem people. I know where your factory is. Paradise Pickles, isn't it? He told me, your mon. He knew where to find Esther. That was what he was trying to say. It was a warning. Amu saw her son's bright, fever button eyes. We must go, she said. Mustn't risk a fever. Their cousin is coming tomorrow, she explained to Uncle, and then added casually, from London. Esther, you stay here with Uncle. I'll get baby Kochima and Rahel, Amu said. Come, Uncle said. Come and sit with me on a high stool. No, Amu. No, Amu, no. I want to come with you. Amu, surprised at the unusually shrill insistence from her usually quiet son, apologized to the orange drink, lemon drink Uncle. He's not usually like this. Come on then, Esteban. The back inside smell. Fan shadows. Backs of heads, necks, collars, hair, buns, plaits, ponytails. We have to go, Amu said to baby Kochima and Rahel. But Amu, Rahel said, the main things haven't even happened yet. He hasn't even kissed her. He hasn't even torn down the Hitler flag yet. They haven't even been betrayed by Rolf the postman. Esther's sick, Amu said. Come on. Outside, Uncle was reorganizing his dim bottles. He was a clean, orange drink, lemon drink uncle. Going then, he said. Yes, Amu said. Where can we get a taxi? Out the gate, up the road, on your left, he said, looking at Rahel. You never told me you had a little mall, too. And holding out another sweet, here, mall, for you. Take mine, Esther said quickly, not wanting Rahel to go near the man. But Rahel had already started towards him. As she approached him, he smiled at her, and something about that portable piano smile, something about the steady gaze in which he held her, made her shrink from him. It was the most hideous thing she had ever seen. She spun around to look at Esther. She backed away from the hairy man. Esther pressed his Paris sweets into her hand, and she felt his fever-hot fingers, whose tips were as cold as death. Bye, Mon, Uncle said to Esther. I'll see you in Ayemenem sometime. So the red steps once again. Sweet chap, that orange drink, lemon drink fellow, Amu said. So why don't you marry him then, Rahel said petulantly. Time stopped on the red staircase. Esther stopped. Baby Kochima stopped. Rahel, Amu said. Rahel froze. She was desperately sorry for what she had said. She didn't know where those words had come from. She didn't know that she'd had them in her, but they were out now and wouldn't go back in. Rahel, Amu said, do you realize what you've just done? Frightened eyes in a fountain looked back at Amu. What? Rahel said in the smallest voice she had. Do you know what happens when you hurt people, Amu said? When you hurt people, they begin to love you less. That's what careless words do. They make people love you a little less. A cold moth with unusually dense dorsal tufts landed lightly on Rahel's heart. Where its icy legs touched her, she got goosebumps. A little less, her Amu loved her. And so, out the gate, up the road, and to the left, the taxi stand. A hurt mother, an ex-nun, a hot child, 
and a cold one, goosebumps and a moth. The taxi smelled of sleep. It was, after all, the taxi driver's home. Driving past the inky sea, Esther put his head out of the window. He could taste the hot salt breeze on his mouth. He could feel it lift his hair. He knew that if Amu found out about what he had done with the orange drink lemon drink man, she'd love him less as well, very much less. He felt the shaming, churning, heaving, turning sickness in his stomach. He longed for the river, because water always helps. The sticky neon night rushed past the taxi window. It was hot inside the taxi and quiet. The moth on Rahel's heart spread its velvet wings and the chill crept into her bones. Room numbers 313 and 327, the man at the reception desk said. Non-air conditioned, twin beds, lift is closed for repair. There were more red steps to climb. The same red carpet from the cinema hall was following them around. Magic flying carpet. Chaco was in his room, caught feasting. He was puzzled to see everybody back so early, but pretended otherwise. He kept eating. The original plan had been that Esther would sleep with Chaco and Rahel with Amu and baby Kochima. But now that Esther wasn't well and love had been reapportioned, Amu loved her a little less, Rahel would have to sleep with Chaco and Esther with Amu and baby Kochima. Amu took Rahel's pajamas and toothbrush out of the suitcase and put them on the bed. Here, Amu said, two clicks to close the suitcase. Click and click. Amu, Rahel said, shall I miss dinner as my punishment? She was keen to exchange punishments. No dinner in exchange for Amu loving her the same as before. As you please, Amu said, but I advise you to eat, if you want to grow, that is. Maybe you could share some of Chaco's chicken. But what about my punishment, Rahel said. You haven't given me my punishment. Some things come with their own punishments, baby Kochima said, as though she was explaining a sum that Rahel couldn't understand. Some things come with their own punishments. Like bedrooms with built-in cupboards. They would all learn more about punishment soon. That they came in different sizes. That some were so big, they were like cupboards with built-in bedrooms. You could spend your whole life in them, wandering through dark shelving. Baby Kochima's goodnight kiss left a little spit on Rahel's cheek. She wiped it off with her shoulder. Good night. God bless, Amu said. But she said it with her back. She was already gone. Good night, Esther said, too sick to love his sister. Rahel stood in the hotel room doorway full of sadness. She had in her the sadness of Sophie Mole coming the sadness of Amu's loving her a little less, and the sadness of whatever the orange drink lemon drink man had done to Esther in Abilash Talkies. Esther ever 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 in Abilash Talkies. Esther light from his bowl. Rahel watched him, and her cold moth spread its wings again. Slow out, Slow in, a predator's lazy blink. Chaco closed the wallet with the photograph and put out the light. Into the night he lit a charminar and wondered what his daughter looked like now. Nine years old, last seen when she was red and wrinkled, barely human. Three weeks later, Margaret, his wife, his only love, had cried and told him about Joe. She asked him for a divorce. Those last few tortured nights before he left her, Chaku would slip out of bed with a torch and look at his sleeping child to learn her, imprint her on his memory. Chaco marveled at how someone so small and undefined, so vague in her resemblances, could so completely command the attention, the love, the sanity of a grown man. When he left, he felt that something had been torn out of him, something big. But Joe was dead now, killed in a car crash, dead as a doorknob a Joe-shaped hole in the universe. In Chaco's photograph, Sophie Moll was seven years old, white and blue, rose-lipped, and Syrian Christian nowhere. Though Mamachi, peering at the photograph, insisted she had Papachi's nose. Chaco, 
Rahel said from her darkened bed. Can I ask you a question? Ask me too, Chaco said. Chaco, do you love Sophie Mole most in the world? She's my daughter, Chaco said. Rahel considered this. Chaco, is it necessary that people have to love their own children most in the world? There are no rules, Chaco said, but people usually do. Chaco, for example, Rahel said. Just for example, is it possible that Amu can love Sophie Mole more than me and Esther? Or for you to love me more than Sophie Mole, for example? Anything's possible in human nature, Chaco said in his reading aloud voice. Talking to the darkness now, suddenly insensitive to his little fountain-haired niece. Love, madness, hope, infinite joy. Of the four things that were possible in human nature, Rahel thongs that were possible in human nature, of the Rahel thongs that were possible in human nature, of the But people usually do. In human while his Amu was asleep and looked beautiful in the barred blue street light that came in through the barred blue window. She smiled a sleep smile that dreamed of dolphins and a deep barred blue. It was a smile that gave no indication that the person who belonged to it was a bomb waiting to go off. Esther alone walked weevily to the bathroom. He vomited a clear, bitter, lemony, sparkling, fizzy liquid. The acrid aftertaste of a little man's first encounter with fear. Dum dum. He felt a little better. He put on his shoes and walked out of his room, laces trailing down the corridor, and stood quietly outside Rahel's door. Rahel stood on a chair and unlatched the door for him. Chaco didn't bother to wonder how she could have possibly known that Esther was at the door. He was used to their sometimes strangeness. He lay like a beached whale on the narrow hotel bed and wondered idly if it had indeed been Valuta that Rahel saw. He wondered whether Valuta had become a card-holding member of the Marxist party and whether he had been seeing comrade K.N.M. Pilla lately. Earlier in the year, Comrade Pilla's political ambitions had been given an unexpected boost. Two local party members, Comrade J. Katukaran and Comrade Guhan Menon, had been expelled from the party as suspected Naxalites. One of them, Comrade Guhan Menon, was tipped to be the party's candidate for the Kotayam by elections to Legislative Assembly due next March. His expulsion from the party created a vacuum that a number of hopefuls were jockeying to fill. Among them, Comrade K.N.M. Pilla. Comrade Pilla had begun to watch the goings-on at Paradise Pickles with the keenness of a substitute at a soccer match. To bring in a new labor union, however small, in what he hoped would be his future constituency, would be an excellent beginning for a journey to the Legislative Assembly. Until then, at Paradise Pickles, Comrade Comrade, as Amu put it, had been no more than a harmless game played outside working hours. But if the stakes were raised and the conductor's baton rested from Chaco's hands, everybody, except Chaco, knew that the factory, already steeped in debt, would be in trouble. Since things were not going well financially, the labor was paid less than the minimum rates specified by the trade union. Of course, it was Chaco himself who pointed this out to them and promised that as soon as things picked up, their wages would be revised. He believed that they trusted him and knew that he had their best interests at heart. But there was someone who thought otherwise. In the evenings, after the factory shift was over, Comrade K. N. M. Pilla waylaid the workers of Paradise Pickles and shepherded them into his printing press. In his reedy, piping voice, he urged them on to revolution. In his speeches, he managed a clever mix of pertinent local issues and grand Maoist rhetoric, which sounded even grander in Malayalam. He never referred to him by name, but always as the management, as though Chaco was many people. Apart from it being tactically the right thing to do, this disjunction between the man and his job helped Comrade Pilla to keep his conscience clear about his own private business dealings with Chaco. His contract for printing the Paradise Pickle labels gave him an income that he badly needed. The only snag in Comrade K. N. M. Pilla's plans was Valuta. Of all the workers at Paradise Pickles, he was the only card-holding member of the party, and that gave Comrade Pilla an ally he would rather have done without. 
He knew that all the other touchable workers in the factory resented Valuta for ancient reasons of their own. Comrade Pilla stepped carefully around this wrinkle, waiting for a suitable opportunity to iron it out. Whenever anything serious happened in the factory, it was always to Mamachi and not Chaco that the news was brought. Perhaps this was because Mamachi fitted properly into the conventional scheme of things. She was the model Lali. She played her part. Her responses, however harsh, were straightforward and predictable. Mamachi tried to caution Chaco. He heard her out, but didn't really listen to what she was saying. So despite the early rumblings of discontent on the premises of Paradise Pickles, Chaco, in rehearsal for the revolution, continued to play Comrade Comrade. On the next bed, his niece and nephew slept with their arms around each other, a hot twin and a cold one. He and she, we and us. Somehow, not wholly unaware of the hint of doom and all that waited in the wings for them, they dreamed of their river. It was warm, the water, grey-green, like rippled silk, with fish in it, with the skies and trees in it, and at night, the broken yellow moon in it. The time was ten to two. Years later, when Rahel returned to the river, it greeted her with a ghastly skull smile, with holes where the teeth had been, and a limp hand raised from a hospital bed. Both things had happened. It had shrunk, and she had grown. Downriver, a saltwater barrage had been built, in exchange for votes from the influential paddy farmer lobby. The barrage regulated the inflow of salt water from the backwaters that opened into the Arabian Sea. So now they had two harvests a year instead of one, more rice for the price of a river. Once it had had the power to evoke fear, to change lives, but now its teeth were drawn, its spirit spent. The stone steps that had once led bathers right down to the water and fisher people to the fish were entirely exposed and led from nowhere to nowhere. On warm days, the smell of shit lifted off the river and hovered over a Yemenem like a hat. Further inland, and still across, a five-star hotel chain had bought the heart of darkness. The history house could no longer be approached from the river. It had turned its back on a Yemenem. The hotel guests were ferried across the backwaters straight from Cochin. They arrived by speedboat, opening up a V of foam on the water, leaving behind a rainbow film of gasoline. The view from the hotel was beautiful, but here too the water was thick and toxic. No swimming signs had been put up in stylish calligraphy. There wasn't much they could do about the smell, but they had a swimming pool for swimming, and fresh tandoori pom frites and crepe Suzette on their menu. Gadi Saipa's house had been renovated and painted, it had become the centerpiece of an elaborate complex, crisscrossed with artificial canals and connecting bridges. Small boats bobbed in the water. The old colonial bungalow, with its deep veranda and dark columns, was surrounded by smaller, older, wooden houses, ancestral homes that the hotel chain had bought from old families and transplanted in the heart of darkness. Toy histories for rich tourists to play in. Heritage, the hotel was called. The hotel people liked to tell their guests that the oldest of the wooden houses, with its airtight panel storeroom, which could hold enough rice to feed an army for a year, had been the ancestral home of comrade EMS Nambudripad, Kerala's Mausitang, they explained to the uninitiated. So there it was then, history and literature enlisted by commerce, Kurtz and Karl Marx joining palms to greet rich guests as they stepped off the boat. In the evenings, for that regional flavor, the tourists were treated to truncated katakali performances. Small attention spans, the hotel people explained to the dancers. So ancient stories were collapsed and amputated. Six-hour classics were slashed to 20-minute cameos. The performances were staged by the swimming pool. While the drummers drummed and the dancers danced, hotel guests frolicked with their children in the water. While Kunti revealed her secret to Karna on the river bank, courting couples rubbed suntan oil on each other. While fathers played sublimated sexual games with their nubile teenage daughters, Putama suckled young Krishna at her poison breast. Bhima disemboweled Dushasana, 
and bathed Draupadi's hair in his blood. The back veranda of the history house, where a posse of touchable policemen converged, where an inflatable goose was burst, had been enclosed and converted into the airy hotel kitchen. Nothing worse than kebabs and caramel custard happened there now. The terror was past, overcome by the smell of food, silenced by the humming of cooks. Something lay buried in the ground, under grass, under twenty-three years of June rain, a small forgotten thing, nothing that the world would miss, a child's plastic wristwatch with a time painted on it, ten to two, it said. 